A very good morning to all who are joining us in the 60-minute webinar today as participants and viewers. This is Sally Chiu from Thomasic Polytechnic bringing you the very first in 2014 of the series of bi-monthly live webinars brought to you jointly by STARA, the Singapore Training and Development Association, and Thomasic Polytechnic Centre for Transcultural Studies. The last webinar, we had Dr. Victoria Masik, Professor of Adult Learning and Leadership at Columbia University, share with us how we can tap into collective learning. Today, we are very privileged to have with us a very eminent, well sought after speaker and thought leader on the subject of neuroscience of learning, Dr. David Brock. To properly introduce you to David would certainly take more than the 60 minutes we have for today. And so I will improperly introduce you to him and I would strongly encourage you to spend time looking him up in cyberspace. There is so much about him that he's doing globally in this area. Now just a very quick introduction to Dr. David Rock. Dr. David Rock, CEO of Neuro Leadership Group. He coined the term Neuro Leadership. He's director of the Neuro Leadership Institute, a global initiative bringing together neuroscientists and leadership experts to build a new science for leadership development. Isn't this exciting? He also co-edits the Neuro Leadership Journal. He heads up an annual global summit. He has written many academic and discussion papers discussing the field of neuro leadership. He's author of so many books, but I think his bestseller is the one, Quiet Leadership, and I went to look it up. He's got books on coaching with the brain, this one. He blogs in Harvard Business Review, Fortune Magazine, Psychology Today, and many, many others. Thank you very much. Come here. Hi, Robert. Cannot hear you. We apologize. We disappeared for a short while. We are back again and we are still on David. There is just so much to share about David. In a few uh, moments, David will come on. I will just finish up with this little bit about what David is doing besides all that we have heard so far. Academically, David is on the faculty and advisory board of Simba, an international business school based in Europe. He's a guest lecturer at many universities, including Oxford University's Business School. He's on the board of Blue School, an initiative in New York City, and he's building a new approach to education. He received his professional doctorate in neuroscience of leadership from the Middlesex University in 2010. Originally an Australian, he now lives in New York City, and we want to thank him because this is really evening for him. We look forward to a very enriching session with David. And David, it is all over to you now. Thank you very much. Can you hear me OK? We can hear you good. Excellent. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I still keep my Australian accent uh, living in New York, although uh, sometimes I have to sound American for people to understand me. Um, the, uh, Singapore is a wonderful place. I will be there uh, again in um, about a month, and I have probably uh, lived in Singapore for maybe a year and a half all up in the last 10 years, spread out over uh, maybe a, a few weeks at a time. Um, it's, it's a wonderful country and I have um, a lot of fun making Americans very upset by telling them uh, what a fantastic country Singapore is and how they should be more like Singapore. And uh, it always makes Americans very upset. They, they don't understand that it's actually true. Um, there's, there's many great things about, uh, about the culture there. Uh, what I want to talk to you today about is um, really uh, some underpinning work around learning that we've, we've been researching since 2009. And it's, it's really um, the beginning of an answer to a question, um, you know, what makes learning work in the brain? 
Um, what are the active ingredients in learning? And uh, I'll, I'll turn my slides on and we can uh, kind of start looking through that. I'm, there we go. Can you see my slide there? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. So yeah, I want to talk about the, the neuroscience of learning and uh, give you a sense of, of um, our, our research on uh, kind of what makes learning really stick. And just, a, a, I want to spend maybe a minute or two, first of all, giving you a sense of, um, of my work and what we're doing. I run two organizations, um, the Neuroleadership Institute. You can see the logo there on the left is a research function. We have uh, a team of neuroscientists on staff and partnerships with the leading labs around the world. Um, and the Institute is publishing an academic journal every year, running a big summit. Uh, the most important thing we're doing is really um, thinking about the neuroscience of leadership, learning, and change um, by organizing and summarizing the neuroscience coming out today from the, 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 the labs that are doing the original work. So we have the Neuroleadership Institute. We also have the Neuroleadership Group, which is, is operationalizing this research with large organizations as well. So we apply the insights to organizations. And our vision is transform leadership through neuroscience. Um, and put simply, we believe that there is tremendous value in bringing an understanding of the biology to how we develop leaders um, at every level. And when I say leaders, I mean anyone from uh, a customer service person who needs to have leadership skills uh, to a first-line leader, to mid-level leaders, to a senior executive across all industries, across all countries. The, the act of, to me, the leadership is the act of influencing uh, successfully, the act of driving change effectively. It's the act of kind of getting people to do what you think should be done. Um, so it's a very broad definition, and we think that understanding the biology of leadership shows uh, tremendous value. So our, our mission overall is building a new language for leadership, and we do that in three functions. Uh, we do a lot of original research, and I'll share with you one of the big uh, frameworks that we published uh, in this space. Uh, we also then provide education, so we have uh, from a brief introduction all the way to a full master's degree in the neuroscience of leadership. And then we commercialize and operationalize this with organizations as well. And uh, actually, we've been working with a number of large firms and government in Singapore to introduce this work there. So um, just to give you a sense of the research that we do, um, we're working across lab studies closest to the brain, as well as summary frameworks, um, and then also applied studies closest to organizations. And I'm going to show you today one of our um, major summary frameworks that we've built. Um, around learning, and it summarizes a huge, huge body of research that's emerging about learning itself. Um, but just to, to kind of go up a level, the field itself um, is around, uh, is organized in these four domains. Um, the neuroscience of how leaders make decisions and solve problems, manage emotions, collaborate with others and facilitate change. Um, and learning very much lives across all of these domains as a, uh, as a function. So that's some, you know, that's enough about us. Let's dive into the neuroscience of learning and, and how it works. And I want to make a distinction, first of all, between um, explicit and implicit learning. Um, and implicit learning is something that you learn without necessarily knowing you learn it, you, you've learned it. Uh, it's something that's more unconscious. Uh, often it's, um, it's, it's, it's physical, like learning how to operate a machine or a car, um, learning how perhaps to, to ski, not very popular in Singapore. I know, but we're having uh, minus 13 degrees tomorrow here, so there'll be some snow coming in here in the next few days. But learning how to ski, um, it's, 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 it's implicit memory, not explicit. Explicit is more language, there's more language involved. There's a, a clear process. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is more of that kind of learning. How do we teach people things that they need to remember? How do we teach people things that, that may need to become habitual, it may need to become a habit, but the pathway to that is learning a process and understanding a set of ideas. So that's what we'll look at. So first idea is just a, a, a high-level understanding of how, the, how memories form, essentially. So memories are not stored in any one place across the brain. Um, you've probably heard of the hippocampus. We'll come back to that in a minute. The hippocampus is central for learning, but it doesn't store memories in, in, in the hippocampus. A memory is a web of connections across the whole brain. And so the word wind, for example, W-I-N-D, might be connected to cold, connected to Thanksgiving if you're American, um, you know, turkey, pumpkins. might also be connected to flag and you know, all those other words. 
And so every idea, every memory lives inside a web of connections. And those connections really form right across the whole brain. It's not stored in any one part. And what we see is that whether we can recall an idea um, is very, very closely correlated to the strength and complexity of that web. So think of a spider web. Um, and what you're talking about is a, if, you, if you want a memory to really stick, you want a very robust spider web. Lots of links. The links are very strong. Um, it's very, very connected. And it's connected into the existing web. So a new spider web, if you want it to, uh, to stick, or a new web of memories, if you want it to stick, it should be connected at many, many points to the existing webs that are actually there. It's very important. Now, this was a theory that was untested until just the last two or three years. And some very, very clever experiments were done in the neuroscience lab showing that this concept um, actually is how the brain literally stores memories. It's not just a theory anymore. This is literally how they believe memories are stored. So the hippocampus, just to go to this, um, is this wonderful region. Um, as I said, it's, it's not where memories are stored, but the, the strength of activation of the hippocampus during a memory task um, correlates to the extent and complexity and strength of the, of the web you create. And so the hippocampus is this wonderful quality of being like a, like a gauge um, on a, uh, if you think of a, 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 uh, like a thermometer uh, or something that you can use to measure uh, something. So the hippocampus activates according to how well you'll remember something later. So you can put someone in a scanner, in an fMRI scanner that reads oxygen flow, blood flow, and you can give them a task like they've got to remember a series of numbers or words and how much their hippocampus activates during that task very closely correlates to whether they'll recall that information later. And you can see that in, in scanning. And um, this finding is quite robust. It's been known for a long time. And so for the last decade or so, neuroscientists have been essentially trying different strategies out um, to see kind of what makes the hippo sing, the way I like to say it. What makes the hippo sing? You know, what really um, activates the hippocampus? Because we know that that correlates to strong encoding and strong recall later. So what we've seen is um, that there are a, a, a set of conditions that combine together for maximal encoding. And I'll give you a high-level summary of this, and then um, uh, through our connection with Stata, I'll happily share out the original paper that we published. And you can share this with students. I'll, um, I'll, I'll send this. Uh, my, my assistant can send it out to, uh, to you. Um, but the, the paper essentially was about two years' work working with uh, Leila Dabachi at some for about a year, who's the head of the memory lab at NYU, um, and, and working with a team of us to say, let's organize all the literature and find the patterns in thousands of studies coming out about memory to say, kind of, what are the must haves if you want to make the hippocampus really activate? And it turns out there are four conditions that interact with each other that all need to be very high for the hippocampus to activate very strongly. And I'll explain these at high level. There's a huge amount of research behind it. Um, I'll explain these at high level, and then I'll take your questions um, for, um, for about 15 minutes as well. So what I might do is, is um, go through uh, each one and then see if there's any questions as we go as well. So attention um, uh, is a very interesting thing. Um, divided attention, even the tiniest bit, significantly reduces activation of the hippocampus. So if you're sitting in a classroom um, and it looks like people are paying attention, but every five minutes they're checking their phones, then their attention is going to constantly be going back, not just to their phone, but to the ideas that are coming to them through their emails. And their mind is going to be very split between multiple fields. And what we're seeing in classrooms now, whether it's an online classroom or an in-person classroom, is a massive deterioration of attention. And this is a little bit of a problem, um, because you only need a very small reduction in attention and the hippocampus doesn't activate very much. The hippocampus activates when there's this signal that something is important. And when you're flitting between multiple things, um, you don't get the signal in the brain that something is very, very important. So you don't get robust activation. And one of the things that's happening in um, our learners out there is learners are, be uh, are very much becoming high media users. Learners are people who are you know, looking at a webinar at the same time as checking their iPhone, same time maybe as you know, looking at a computer elsewhere or their iPad. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that people who are using multimedia, people who are high um, media users, are actually more easy to distract and start to fall on the, um, the, the ADD continuum, the, the ADHD continuum, 
um, in terms of very, very easy to distract. And there's some research last year on this showing that people who think that they're very good at, at multitasking are actually worse at it than, uh, than the average person. The more you multitask, the more distractible you actually become rather than the more capable of focusing you actually become. So it's a very interesting challenge in that um, we're having people who, even in the classroom, we're sort of giving them lots and lots of media, lots and lots of different things, where actually the brain needs deep focus if we want people to learn. And there's, a, there's just a difference between what people want and what the brain needs. You know, what people want is to sort of feel happy, feel positive, not necessarily feel stretched. What the brain needs is to actually put in effort and really focus if we want to learn. So there's a lot more to say about that. Um, what we're seeing in, 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 in new work is about 20 minutes of attention is, is about a maximum you want to give people before you change gears, mental gears in some ways. So you want to shift things up, break things up. Don't have people focus on more than 20 minutes just listening, for example. Um, get them speaking, get them writing, get them doing something else. Um, so in that spirit, what I'll say is uh, right now, if you, if you have a question, I'll, I'll take your questions now. And if you don't have a question, just take a moment, reflect, and make some notes about whatever's coming to mind for you right now. Um, and I'll pause kind of new content and let you digest uh, what's happening there. But let me see, does anyone have any question on attention to, to begin with and some of, the, some of the findings coming out about attention itself? No specific questions coming through? I'll keep going and then uh, save your questions. Uh, you, can, you can ask some questions at the end if you'd like. Just take a moment to reflect on kind of what does this mean? If, if attention has to be 100% for learning to stick, what does this mean for creating learning programs or for being in a learning program? What does this actually mean? Just take a moment to reflect, make some notes. For participants out there, if you want to have a question, you raise your hand so that we can then unmute you. Great. Okay, let's go on. So um, we're talking about attention, and the big insight from neuroscience is a small distractor, and I'm talking about if you're running a webinar, uh, a small distractor is um, just the chat on the side um, or um, anything that splits our attention significantly reduces the recall later on of the ideas. Now sometimes that doesn't matter. Sometimes if we're just sharing information, we want people just to you know, generally get an idea, it doesn't matter. But if we want people to recall an idea and you know, six months later really remember what was shared, then we need 100% of attention. That's the, that, and I think that's one of the questions we have to ask ourselves. Um, you know, do we need people to really recall this information? And if we do, 100% of attention can't be, uh, can't be messed with. So generation, the next piece, generation, what we do with information once it is attended to has a powerful impact on memory. So this is, um, this is an important uh, construct. Essentially, generation means making links between that kind of web that you're trying to embed and the existing webs that are there, kind of finding those points of, of touch between the, the, the web that you're trying to lay on to people's brains and the webs that are already existing. And so generation means um, making links. And there are, there are different levels of generation. You can think about this um, uh, on, on, on the next page. You can think about this. There's kind of structural generation, which is just something like, um, you know, is the word in capital letters. There's phonological generation, so just getting people to do something that has a bit more meaning. But the, the best type of generation is, is meaning generation or semantic generation. So would the word fit in a sentence, for example? So just a simple thing like trying to get someone to remember table, market, or friend. Um, you'll get dramatically more memory if you ask people more of a semantic question. If you focus on meaning, then you will just focusing on some of the higher levels. And one of the, um, one of the highest forms of generation we see occurs during what we think of as a moment of insight. And a moment of insight, um, something that we're studying quite uh, intensively at the moment at the Institute, a moment of insight is a moment where a piece of information or just a different perspective that you're putting on um, actually changes your circuitry in quite a robust way. So when you have this kind of sudden aha moment when you, you know, suddenly see a, a challenge in a new light, for example, uh, you know, you're seeing a, a work challenge in a whole new light maybe as an opportunity instead of a, instead of a, a, you know, a threat. 
Um, that, that moment where you change how you see the situation changes your brain. And um, what we see, the moment of insight itself um, actually changes the neural circuitry in a way that it doesn't go back for um, probably forever. And insight also creates a strong, strong amount of engagement, kind of enthusiasm for ideas. Um, and one of the big findings that's very interesting is insight changes your brain so much that when you learn an idea through insight uh, versus just kind of following someone's instructions, that what you've learned becomes a general rule that's applicable to everything. So let me explain what I mean. Um, if I say to you, if I'm, if I'm trying to teach you to be, for example, a, a better manager, and I say to you, um, you know, to be a better manager, you need to go into a meeting and um, not just focus on the details, but ask about people's goals. So, you know, don't micromanage. Ask people about their goals. Then you might follow my instructions and go and do that, but you haven't necessarily had an insight. But if I bring you as a manager to an insight about the importance of letting people think and the importance of, you know, not getting into the details and letting other people be detailed, if, I, if, if you have an insight about that, then you start being more effective as a manager with those people, but you find yourself doing that at home with your teenage kids as well. And you find yourself doing that like with your friends. And you find yourself doing it in all types of projects. So what happens is when we learn through insight, the rules become generalized. And this is very, very important for, for, for real behavior change. Is we don't just want people to kind of follow a method. We really want them to generalize a rule and kind of embody the rule, embody the idea. So it's a very important thing. So learning through insight, we think, is one of the most um, important and powerful forms of generation. If you think of generation being uh, something where you're, you're, you're getting an idea and it's, it's generating new maps in the brain, then insight is, is, is really changing the brain. It's very, very strong generation there. Um, so let me give you a, a chance to generate now. How do you use generation now in training as a giver or receiver of training? How do you see, you know, how are you using generation now? How is generation being applied? And if you're willing to have a go at this, in, in, you know, right now on a notepad, list three learning activities with high generation that either you deliver and present or have been a part of. So reflect for a moment and think of three learning activities with high generation. Either you deliver or, or being part of. Just take a moment for that. And if anyone has a question, I'm happy happy to uh, answer that as well. <clears throat> Give you a moment to reflect on that. Think about three activities that you've been. I, I should have said you right at, right at the beginning. If you want to get the most out of the session, I'm going to give you some little exercises to do as we go, so that you're uh, not uh, suddenly surprised. So please feel free to. Um, uh, to do some of these exercises as we go. Okay, so so those are my, my questions. I'll just go back to the, those slides. It, how do you use generation now and list three learning activities with high generation you've delivered or, or been part of? So this is, an act, this is an activity you could do right now to help you hopefully have your own insights, in this case about generation, um, versus me just kind of giving you information about generation. Okay, so it's important to... Uh, uh, to see the difference between those two. Okay, let me just turn that off. All right. So, um, any questions on generation? So, we've got attention, we've got generation. Any questions on those two before we go on to emotions? Let's go on to emotions. What, do we, what are we learning about emotions? Now, emotions are a little bit more complicated in the mix. Um, it's not a simple... Um, it's not a kind of simple story around emotions, um, except sort of biologically. The simple story biologically is um, the hippocampus and the amygdala are connected. So um, the amygdala essentially holds a memory of how important something is. So if you feel strongly about an issue, either positively or negatively, it's stored in the amygdala. Also, if you feel very uncertain about an issue, that's stored in the amygdala. So if I say the word um, friend, and if you have no real issue, no real emotion about the word friend, you won't get much amygdala light up. If you just had an argument with your friend, your best friend, your amygdala will light up. If you've just found a new best friend and you're really enjoying that, your amygdala would light up. If you're feeling really lonely and don't know who your friends are at the moment, your amygdala would light up if you're feeling uncertain about your know, friends. So, so the amygdala um, lights up um, and uh, according to the strength of an emotional reaction. Now, 
What's important to know is, is we only really recall things that have an emotional connection, that we have an emotional connection to. We only really recall things that we feel emotional about. So if there's no emotional connection to an idea, we basically don't recall it. It's very hard. So, so if you think about the sort of um, intensive learning experiences that we put leaders through, um, often they're you know ropes courses or you know rock climbing or, or something that that creates quite strong emotions, and people can remember those experiences, but they're usually quite strong negative emotions. But the ideal is a negative emotion that's then turned into a positive emotion, so a kind of a challenge that feels really scary that then somehow is surmounted and becomes a positive emotion, and then there's an insight that's linked to that. And what we see is that the shift from negative to positive is one of the things that's remembered very, very, very well by the, uh, the amygdala in particular. So, so when something's shifted from a negative to a positive, it's quite an intense memory. We can recall those situations. Uh, we can recall the, um, the sports games that had that kind of uh, situation the easiest. You know, when we thought our team was going to be down and they ended up being the winner, those are the ones that we remember the best. So emotions are... Um, uh, you know, ideally, we want people to feel, feel quite strong emotions. Um, emotions grab your attention. Um, memory is enhanced. Memory consolidation is enhanced through the amygdala. But at the same time, strong emotions can actually reduce your perception and cognition. Essentially, strong emotions can make people less effective in the moment. So you don't want people to experience overwhelming emotions. You want them to have a fairly high but not too high level of arousal or stress. So a little arousal is good, prolonged stress is not for, for learning. People who are stressed for hours and hours in a, in a, in a, in a learning environment will not probably learn. So um, a little bit of, of strong emotion, but then letting people win. A little bit of strong emotion, then perhaps letting people win can be helpful. So, um, so the, your emotions have to be quite high for learning to really, really stick. Now this is, again is a bit of a challenge. In the virtual environment, if you're running webinars, you're doing things, emotions are not very high. Um, there's not much at stake. You know, in a virtual learning environment, there are not a lot of emotions at play. Um, so we need, to, we need to create ways of making things kind of more engaging emotionally. Um, without good emotions, we won't recall information that we learned. Now, um, there's an interesting um, uh, framework that uh, I, I want to introduce you to, if you haven't seen it already, that, that describes the, the things that we feel strongest about. Um, it describes the... Um, the, 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 uh, the, the experience of life that, that we feel strongest about in terms of either threat or reward. And the, the brain classifies everything um, as threat or reward. We, we're built to stay away from threat or move toward reward. This is the basis of emotions. Emotions are either away emotions or toward emotions. Now, in a general situation, a slight toward state is best for perception, cognition, creativity, collaboration. So a slight toward state is the best state for sort of, you know, general work. But for learning, it's not necessarily the best state. For learning, you want a much stronger reward state or even a threat state. You want quite strong emotions for learning. So it's good to know what is it that creates strong emotions. And again, strong but not too strong. So the framework to think about is called the SCARF model. It stands for Status, Certainty, Autonomy, Relatedness, and Fairness. And these are the five uh, goals of the brain, almost like the intrinsic goals. We think they are the intrinsic goals of the brain. And it's building on Desi and Ryan's work looking at autonomy um, and mastery and sense of connection to others um, as being the, the sort of intrinsic goals of the brain. We think that it's actually status, which is a sense of you compared to others. Certainty, which is the ability to predict what's happening. Autonomy, which is a sense of control. Uh, relatedness, which is a sense of shared goals. And fairness, which is, is self-explanatory. So these five domains of experience are, um, are driving our behavior in a big way. And um, to put it simply, when you go into a learning environment in the classroom, your status is threatened, your certainty is threatened, your autonomy is threatened. Um, relatedness, well, it depends. If you're with new people, you have no shared goals, that's probably threatened. And fairness, you know, that depends. But at least three or four of these are easily in, in the negative. So that creates quite a strong threat state overall. And um, what you really want to do is move people from that threat state to perhaps a strong positive state with um, you know, having people win, creating a, an increased sense of status, increased sense of certainty, autonomy, etc. One of the best ways to do that is with relatedness. Relatedness is a sense of shared goals. If you walk into a classroom and feeling unrelated, you, know, you, you, you might find the overall threat level is too much, but when you make friends with people, 
and find you all have similar goals, now you become much more balanced in, um, in your emotions. So there's a lot more to say about this, but um, uh, I'll just pause there and say that emotions are um, absolutely central for, um, for learning. And if we don't create experiences that have emotions, we're not activating the hippocampus and people just won't remember the ideas later on. Um, I'll keep going and then um, take questions, at, uh, I think, for, this, for the second part. So spacing is the final piece, and um, spacing is an interesting one. Um, if you're trying to learn something, a, bl a block of information, you'll learn much, much longer if you space out the learning than if you learn in one block. Um, so spacing learning um, or spacing any kind of embedding exercise over time leads to longer retention than cramming into one session. This is a very robust effect, but um, despite this, we predict otherwise. So we actually believe that we will learn more in a block. This is based on something called the massing effect, where um, if you want to remember something short term, then actually studying in one go does work. So if you if you want to um, study for an exam, for example, then you know doing a, a huge cram sort of the two days before, you know just for that exam, doing it all in one block, that will actually serve you fairly well. However, you won't remember anything that you learned maybe a month later or two months later, compared to if you studied every week for three months, for example. And so the massing effect works, and it sort of you know pays pays out for us in some ways. Um, but we predict that um, we sort of generalize that, and we predict that all learning is that is best done in a block, and it's just not the case. So there's lots and lots of research showing that. Um, when you start to uh, space out learning, you get a significant increase in retention. Let me give you an example. If you have a four-hour classroom, four hours of learning, and you normally deliver that in one day, if you break that into four one-hour sessions, uh, for example, one hour a week for four weeks, um, people will predict that they won't learn as much. They'll say, I'll learn better in the four hours. They'll learn significantly more, at least 30 to 50 percent more. Um, they'll recall at least 30 to 50 percent more if you actually put that in four one-hour learning events than in four single hours. Um, or even something as simple as um, a full-day program, if you split it into two parts and uh, do those you know, half a day, a half a day twice, spacing that out, maybe a week apart, two weeks apart, again, significantly more retention. Now, there's a number of reasons why this happens. Um, one of the reasons is, is called changing context. So what happens is the first half day uh, that you learn the information, um, you're, uh, you, you're in a certain context, sitting next to a certain person, having eaten a certain meal, etc. So it's in, a, in, in one web of memories. But when you learn again in a new context, you're activating a new web of memories. So you, you, you're doubling the context cues. So you, you, it's much easier to find the memory because you've got twice as many links to that memory now. The other thing is the, the, the rest situation. So you get significantly um, increased memory trace just from rest. So um, before, like, like doing a task for an hour, um, coming back to it the next day, you get significant increase in your performance and effectiveness having done no learning overnight, but just from your brain consolidating the learning. Um, and there's a third effect that we've been writing about recently, which is that, which is very important, which is that um, the, the build on it effect, kind of learning one chunk and then digesting it, then adding another chunk and digesting and then adding another chunk digesting, that's very, very helpful as well. So, I mean, I'll just give you a, a quick example of this in terms of the impact of this. Um, DL, the, the line on the left is distributed learning. Uh, ML on the right, the dark purple, is, is mass learning. And so you get quite a big difference um, uh, in terms of memory. So this is from, from number of items recalled from 40 to 60. Um, which is about a 50% increase in at day seven, and at day 30, it's a little deceptive. That's actually a bigger increase percentage-wise. Um, so a month later, the the distributed learning is even more effective um, than the mass learning. So learning it over time. So so you're seeing you know a 50 or more percent increase um, in the number of items recalled uh, by just spacing out the learning a little bit. So again, people think it's the other way around, but the neuroscience is saying otherwise. So here are the four buckets, um, and um, they, they interact, obviously, in various ways. Attention, generation, emotion, spacing. Um, 
you know, if you have high attention, you're more likely to have good generation and good emotions. Uh, spacing is kind of a separate issue. But if you don't have attention, you, you don't have attention, but you're also not generating and probably not having emotion. So it sort of does start with attention. We have to think of ways to have complete attention, both in a class and in a virtual environment and in e-learning. How do we have complete attention? So one of the things I'll challenge you to do as you're thinking about designing learning events or participating or managing learning events is assess the learning modality you have against ages. Um, assess the learning modality against ages is attention, kind of high, medium, or low, generation, high, medium, or low, etc. Um, and, and there's only a couple of learning strategies that seem to have very high ages overall. One of them is coaching. So one-to-one -one coaching, you have very high attention, very high generation, high emotions, and high spacing. Uh, action learning, again, high generation, uh, high attention, generation, emotion, spacing. So action learning and coaching are very good. Um, we've developed a specific um, uh, application of this research to virtual learning that, that kind of role models uh, coaching, but in small groups, where we can get a group of 12 to 24 people together uh, virtually and actually have very high ages. So it's, it's doing learning, but in a more coaching style in small groups, and we can do that virtually. So it's possible to do virtual learning, um, but you, you must focus with do you have attention. Uh, and, and, and the first rule of thumb there is, is, um, is not so much is, is the work exciting, but, but do people know they can be called on it at any moment? That's really key. So, it, so ages, I, I encourage you to sort of think about measuring your learning strategies against ages and, uh, and see what you, can, uh, what you can see there. All right, so let me pause there and start to take some questions, comments, reflections, um, and then I'll do some, some um, then I'll give you a kind of one more piece. I'd like to pause there on ages, then I'll give you one more piece I think is a much overlooked insight about um, learning as well. Thank you, David. Participants, it's your turn now. And we have participants from Philippines, US, India, and Singapore. If you are ready, please um, indicate with your hand so that we can quickly unmute you because um, Jennifer, I see you're on. <laughs> Hi. Welcome, Jennifer. Shoot your question. Yeah, um, so David, what I heard you just say, um, and tell me if I'm wrong here, is that one of the ways to create attention is to make it so that people feel like they're going to be called on. Is that correct? Yeah. But doesn't that it, also kind of heighten that sense of threat? It does. It does. Indeed. And this is what I was saying before, that um, just making people happy and comfortable in a classroom doesn't necessarily mean they're learning. That actually um, a lot of learning comes from doing quite difficult things that feel like a stretch and feel difficult and are actually uncomfortable. And I know in, in the US, you know, the, the kind of the entire economy in the US is devoted to making people never feel uncomfortable. So it's, it's, it's you know, we should never make people do something difficult. But actually for learning, um, a little bit of threat is quite good. A lot of threat is not good. But a little bit of threat is quite good. So there's a thing called, uh, that we, it's a term that I coined, it's positive social pressure. And positive social pressure means um, essentially that at any moment you could be called on in front of your peers to have to answer a question. And um, you can use positive social pressure to make people a little bit anxious, but what that anxiety does is it makes them pay attention. So it's not an overwhelming anxiety. So if you, if you, but if you did that, if you created positive social pressure and then when someone spoke up, you attacked their ideas and told them they were wrong and made them look stupid, then no one would ever speak up and it would be an overwhelming threat. So it's kind of surfing a fine line. You want positive social pressure, but not too much. But you don't want low, you don't want no social pressure, you know? Um, so yeah, so there is a there is a sort of challenge and a, a, a sort of subtlety in that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that there sounds to me like what you're describing is a real tension there, and you know what I'm wondering is that po what are you calling it the positive social pressure? Is that different? You know, does that have differing levels based on who you are? And so, I mean, it feels all of a sudden really complicated. <laughs> is that a fair assessment? Well, it's not complicated on one level, 
I tell you what's really simple is are people paying attention to your ideas or not? And it's, it's really simple at one level. You go, where is people's attention? That's what it comes down to. And if people's attention is with your ideas, then you've got a chance of generation and emotion. If people's attention is not 100% with your ideas, you've got no chance with generation and emotion. So it all kind of starts with, do you have 100% of attention? Um, okay. And in, in this age where people can, you know, buy and sell anything and everything, you know, instantaneously on a device, wherever they are, it's very hard to get attention just through bells and whistles. We need kind of something else. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank you. David and Jennifer. David, we're going to put into practice what you talk about. We'll create some stress, not distress. All participants, be prepared. You're being, you, will, you will be called in pawn very shortly. I'm going to move from Jennifer Moore from Sway Talent Management US to now Benjamin Cheng, NEC Asia Pacific. Benjamin, would you like to contribute your question? Benjamin, you are unmuted. You want to contribute your question? I see you I, have I told also. Anton that uh, I'm typing my question. You are typing your question. Okay. Uh, yeah, I see it being typed on the screen. If I can help you read it out. How do you find the balance in the area of emotion? You need heightened emotions, but not prolonged emotional highs. How do we find the balance, David? It's that's an awesome. excellent question. That's, that's the art part of the science, I guess. Um, what you don't want is no emotions. You know, you don't want no emotions. Um, and you don't want very, very strong emotions. You don't want emotions so strong that people are shutting down, and either positive or negative, although it's usually the negative. Um, one way to think about that is through the lens of the SCARF model. So SCARF describes the five things we feel most passionate about. Now, here's the thing. If you... Um, if you like give someone some feedback that their you know the task they've done in a classroom is not right, um, but you do it quietly and you do it fairly and they understand what you mean and they have some control over now doing it again um, and they trust you, you know it will really frustrate them, but it will be a manageable threat and they'll probably go and you know relearn the task. So that's what I've just described is, is a threat to status, but no threat to certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. But if you, you know, tell someone they've done a task wrong and don't really explain it so, it's, it, so they're even more uncertain, right? and don't let them have another go, to, you know, take away autonomy or control, and um, you know, they don't trust you, and especially if you're unfair, then you'll get a very strong threat response and people will shut down. And so I've just described the multiplying effect so the multiplying effect, we believe, is where you've got many domains of SCARF in the negative. So what you want to do is, is you might have you know, one or two domains of SCARF in, in the negative, but you don't want all of them in the negative. Um, so for example, if you're going to use positive social pressure and attack people's status, make sure you're increasing their sense of certainty moment to moment about what they're learning. Make sure that they, if they don't have any sense of autonomy, uh, then at least make sure there are shared goals across the group so everyone knows the goals really clearly and shares those. So think about having you know, many of the domains in the positive um, and just one or two in the negative. That's the way to think about it. And, and the other thing is just to read the room. You know, when, um, read the room, read the environment. If you sense that the stress is too high, you sense that the emotions are too strong, uh, you're going to bring that back probably with going back to relatedness, which is shared goals going back to, all right, what are we here for, what are we here to do, and kind of, you know, sharing a bit within the group. Um, so it's, it's, you know, there's certainly an art to it, but the SCAR framework gives you access to kind of pulling apart the emotional experience and, and thinking about it in new ways. Thank you, David. Benjamin, does that answer your question? I think so. Uh, we have many more participants waiting to share their question. Perhaps I would go to the question from Sharon Tian, Vice Principal from Yishun Junior College. Her question, David, is, what about mentoring? Can we assess that against the ages model? That's a good question. Mentoring, um, 
should be quite high ages, like coaching. The challenge with mentoring is the spacing often is very low, like once a year, <laughs> so um, or maybe twice a year. So there's, it's not really spacing the you know any kind of learning. So if you are mentoring someone and and meeting every month or every two months, maybe every three months at the most, and, and really sharing learning, um, then then you probably would say it. it, it it has all the qualities of ages. But attention is high, generation is high, emotions are quite high with mentoring, but spacing not so much. Often mentoring is you know all in one block, maybe once a year or now and again. So you just like to mentor regularly with someone, and you'd get all the qualities of ages high. Thank you, David. Before we get Robert, I think Robert is ready to come on. Um, Adam A from Philippines, would you want to have your question first, or would you want to contribute a question later? Perhaps uh, you can contribute to, on uh, you know, to the Google, and then we will look for your question. Robert, you look like you're all set with your question. Robert, Robert is from Stada, Ed Stada. Good morning, David. Good morning, Robert. Good to connect. Uh, thanks, Ali. Um, you know, remember we talked about reflection sometime back uh, when we were in Sydney, and how to create uh, that discipline in terms of reflection, and with your, your chart, you, you show reflection, and then you went on to say insight. Now, how do you correlate to help somebody to not only reflect, but to internalize that reflection so that it stays in the memory? How do you yeah. correlate that? Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. I actually published a paper on this in the um, ASTD journal um, in the US. It's called The AHA Moment. And you can, you can look it up. I think you'll be able to find it if you just Google this, uh, The AHA Moment by David Rock, and it, the AHA moment summarizes the four conditions that need to be high for insight to occur. It's, it's it, in the same way that ages is a summary of what makes the hippocampus activate. Um, there's a framework that we worked out underneath the reflection stage of insight um, that describes the four, the four necessary conditions for, necess for, for reflection to most likely lead to insight. It doesn't mean insight will happen, but these four conditions make insight much more likely. Uh, one of these conditions is uh, basically quiet, um, so the brain being quiet, so not a lot of traffic. Uh, the second one is um, uh, internally focused, so we have a lot more insights when we're able to reflect and look inside our own thoughts. The third one is um, slightly positive, so if you ask someone a question, you know, what's the opportunity here, they'll have a lot more insights than if you say, what's the problem here? Um, and it's quite a big difference. It's quite a significant difference in the number of insights. So being slightly positive is better than being uh, negative focused for insight itself. And then the fourth one is the confound. The fourth one is, is not working directly on the problem. So if we want to have insight, we don't want to go after the problem directly. Um, Unless we might go after a problem and then solve it, we don't need insight. But usually we go after a problem, we haven't been able to solve it, and we hit an impasse. And then we need to stop consciously solving the problem. And so, so you, can, you, can, you can ask questions that get to this. Um, it sounds complicated, but you can ask questions that, that, that don't go directly to the problem, but go to people's thinking about the problem. Um, they kind of activate metacognition. So questions that get people to think about their thinking um, are more likely to make people quiet, internally focused, positive, and not working on the problem. So we think that, that metacognition or thinking about your thinking are, are very good types of questions for, um, for generating insight. So have a look at that paper, The AHA Moment, and you'll see a lot more of our work in, uh, in that space. Um, and so, so certainly for a facilitator or trainer, um, you, you know, so much of it is about which question, you know, what's the question you ask people? in an activity that's most likely to generate insight. And that paper can help you think that through. Thank you, David. Before we get back to Jennifer, who looks like she has another question, I'm going to move over to the young people, the students from Global Connect Club and the staff. Do you have a question? Or you want to hold? We'll move on to Jennifer. Would you have a question ready? To contribute? No, uh, Not yet. I'm good. You're good. I'll share with you a final piece that I think is important. It's some new work that we've been doing on um, 
on um, learning. And um, one of the things that we see in, in, in learning is um, there's a real problem in the architecture of a lot of programs. So we find that a lot of learning programs, whether you're teaching managers or teaching a technical skill, um, there's not a lot of attention paid to the learning architecture. Um, and what's happening is um, there's no coherent weave of information where everything fits together beautifully. So we see this idea of, uh, we, we, we see it's really important to build a, what we call a coherent weave. A coherent weave is where when you recall any one part of the learning, every part of the learning come back, comes back to mind. So you're creating this map where everything's, everything fits together. And when you recall any one part of the network, you're recalling the whole network. Whereas if you have an incoherent weave, then any time you remember any part of the learning, then you get um, a threat response. You get essentially your brain trying to find the pattern. And so um, a coherent weave, uh, we think, is a, is a critical issue and, and, a, and a very rare quality, actually, in learning programs. So we think there are, there are five steps to this. Identify the central threads. Uh, build a stable hierarchy in terms of what I do, which ideas need to come first. Cut out what we call tangles and knots. Uh, a tangle is, is like two ideas that say the same thing. Um, a knot is just an idea that shouldn't be in the network at all. It needs to be out. Um, link everything together very, very, very closely. So, so really uh, find the bridges between all the information. And then the final thing is, 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 is how do you make it memorable. So everyone works on number five. Everyone works on, right, how do I make this information sticky? But they're not thinking about the overall architecture of the learning. Um, and so, you know, doing a mind map on, on a big whiteboard or something of all the ideas you're getting across um, is useful. And just see how everything links together, literally as a weave. Um, and you'll see that there are ideas that just, you know, um, are tangles or knots. Um, what you want is something that's very easy to recall. You know, it's really easy to recall the whole learning map um, in an instant. Um, and so we think this is a this is a key strategy that's missing in learning design. So um, I know I'll be in Singapore um, in a month or so, and I think I'm doing a, a session on some of this for organisations as well. So if anyone in Singapore is from a an organisation, um, certainly reach out to me online, and um, I can connect you with the right people in Singapore. I'll be doing a, a deeper session on on this, but also on on some of our other research around performance management and and other issues. Let me let me summarize as we as we um, as we bring this together. So for me, the the key findings about the neuroscience of learning. The, the, the first one is manage ages and especially the A. If you don't have attention these days, you can't generate or create emotions or really spacing doesn't matter. So manage ages and particularly the A. Uh, work with the brain's limitations. You know, about twenty minutes is a lot of time for learning. Shift gears regularly. Um, if you're in physical environment, then you know, 60 to 90 minutes at the most uh, before you have a break, ideally 60 to 75 minutes. Um, insight matters more than we realize. Insight changes the brain. Insight's a critical element for learning. And then the, the key thing we think is build a coherent weave. So really focus on the architecture of the learning more than just the, uh, the ideas themselves. Um, so that's, that's, that's a final one there. Um, and here's some resources. Um, uh, the dangers of pasteurized learning. If you Google that phrase, you should be able to see that. It's from ASTD. I wrote that for ASTD. I think it's an important one. It talks about programs that have had the goodness taken out of them, you know, the reflections being taken out, uh, the dangers of pasteurized learning. The aha moment is one that I mentioned also in ASTD. Uh, the ages model is in the Neuroleadership Journal. Um, if someone emails my assistant who set this up, she'll, she'll share that out, uh, and, and you can have a look at that paper, the original paper. Or become a member of the Neural Leadership Institute, and you can uh, you can access that that way. Um, and then also case studies of this work um, being operationalized is on neuroleadership.com uh, in terms of resources. And finally, um, just uh, so two websites to be aware of: uh, neuroleadership.org, the institute. So that's for educational programs, um, information about our summits, um, other resources. Journal neuroleadership.com is um, our commercial arm. Uh, and we're also, we, we do coach certification in Singapore. We actually train brain-based coaches in Singapore and across Asia um, out of our Singapore office as well. So if you're interested in some of those uh, open programs, you'll see that at neuroleadership.com. 
So I'll hand back to you for um, any closing questions. We've got a, a few more minutes before we uh, wrap up. Yes, if you have a question, quickly indicate so that we can call upon you. I think I have a group of students uh, afterwards uh, mentoring, is that right? That's exactly right. Participants, if you have no more questions, then it remains for me to thank David for his time, his very generous sharing of resources, and as we gallop into the year 2014, this is the year of the horse, wow. I, for myself, I've benefited so much, David, from your session, I know that I will look at four old things in new ways. The spider's web will remind me of what you have shared this morning very differently. I will remember that age, from what you shared, has an edge, especially in learning. And I will look at weaves, I'm a weaver, and I'll look at scarves very differently. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for that handle to help us also influence learning in the classroom. And much of you said is of so much benefit. Before I sign off, I'm going to invite Robert E.D. of Stada to say a few things. Robert, where are you? Uh, David, again, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time. I know this evening is about what, uh, almost 10, your, your time. So thank you so much for that. Um, very insightful. And uh, I would like to also thank those who listen in. Uh, this is what SADA will be doing. Uh, we will continue to engage our members regionally and globally. And thanks to many friends we have made along the years we, we are, uh, that we have people like David who, who are so willing to share and many more. So thank you again. Uh, the other thing I want to encourage uh, the members is that we are organizing a Singapore delegation to ASTD uh, in May. So if you are interested, please contact SADA and we will try to get you on the, to the team so that we can go and really uh, enjoy ourselves. And I will use this letters called GPS, uh, which is, we will go there with gratitude uh, so that we can learn. We will go there to enjoy ourselves so that we can play. And we will have some surprises for the delegates as well, uh, so that you can look forward to this uh, meeting of ASTD ICE uh, in May. So please uh, note down that date. I think it's 4th of May. Uh, so if you are interested, please let us know. Thank you. And Thank you much, Robert. And I'll be there as well, by the way. Uh, if anyone wants to connect, we're running a whole track at ASTD on um, called Brain at Work. So there'll be a track of sessions that we're doing, and I'll be there uh, facilitating that with some of our researchers. So when are you coming down to Singapore, David? Um, I am there fairly soon. I'm there twice, actually. Um, I'm there in uh, uh, February, the um, end of February, like 24, 25, and then the end of March as well. I think we should connect when you're here. Uh, there are things to be discussed and talk about, David. Sure. All right. I look forward to meeting up with you in Singapore. Absolutely. And with that, a final thank you, David, and our wonderful participants, some who have stayed awake, some who are still in a reflective mode. Many thanks, David, and all to a good year. We see you in March again for the next live webinar. This is Sally Chiu signing off from TP's Global Connect Village. See you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.